Okay, guys, good morning. I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, so today we are going to j dive into one of my favorite lectures to actually talk about. It's actually behavior, because I think behavior is really an interesting topic, and it's not something we really, you know, sort of think about quite that often. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's a particularly interesting topic, because it has lots of implications for humans, it has lots of implications for evolution has all sorts of cool implications for lots of things. So um, before we begin though, um, if you um, haven't had a chance, I uploaded the lecture on um, Monday and it'll be, it's sort of a double lecture just to make things easier for recording and well, it's easier to do in two, in one sitting for you all. So it's the lectures from Monday and Tuesday, they're one combined video. Um, so that's for your viewing pleasure, if you so choose. Um, and the second thing is um, I'm having a weird issue with Blackboard that it's not, um, it's not letting me uh, make new tests for some reason and AKA assignments for you guys. Um, so I haven't been able to make your fourth weekly assignment. So what I'm going to do as opposed to like hoping that IT can fix it today and then you have, you know, extend the time. I, what I'm going to actually just do on the assignment is just give everyone in the class the full 35 points on it. Um, and then we'll just say weekly four is done and we'll, you know, basically have a, a, a week off this week and then we'll go back to the weeklies next week, hopefully when my uh, assignment capacity is fixed overall. So, um, so you get free 35 points um, on this week's assignment. Um, even if you weren't planning on doing it or you're planning on turning it late, uh, you get the free 35 points. So that is my gift to you um, overall. But with that, um, as always, if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the group chat. And as always, um, feel free to speak up if you so choose. So let's get started. Talk about behavior. And uh, this is my dog, Snickers. And uh, I'm going to use her for a few examples through the, the class. Um, and we'll come back to this actual same exact picture of her being cuddled under a blanket because it's a really interesting behavior we've, we've taught our dog to do. So let's get started. So we're thinking about uh, behavior, and we're th it's a really an evolutionary thing. You can evolve behaviors, but when we're thinking about behaviors, it's sort of this weird mixed bag. It's not 100% genetic, and it's sort of not 100% you can be taught it. It's sort of this weird in-between where you can be inherit a behavior or a lifestyle, and you can also be taught it. And it's something that can be passed down, not just through genetics, but also through just parent to kid sort of contact. And so just as a reminder, when we're thinking about evolutionary theory, we're thinking about evolution by natural selection. And when we're thinking about this, it simply means that the environment is selecting for traits that allow organisms to do better, allows them to survive better under the current environmental conditions, get more energy, things like that, which in turn will let them be more likely to sexually reproduce and thus pass their genes on to the next generation, meaning that they're more likely to have children that more closely resemble them. Um, <clears throat> and the idea being is that, um, as I mentioned, the, the most fit organisms, aka those with, that have the best adapted traits to the environment are more likely to reproduce. Now, you can be, you know, fit, remember fitness isn't not like, you know, in the human sense, like I go to the gym and work out a bunch. It's fitness as in how well do I survive in my environment? Because you can imagine you could be something that's really, you know, sort of muscular and great at running, right? But maybe if you live in a very dense jungle, that's not a great thing to be able to do, right? So you might be fit in like the conventional human sense, but you're completely maladapted for that particular environment. So remember, um, it's all about the environment and the environment is selecting. And this is true for the little things, the microbes, all the way up to the big things like us, blue whales, things like that. So, but the question we can ask, and I, I, you know, I would encourage you to sort of think about throughout this class time is, do you think behavior is a trait? And I think <clears throat> as an, and as I mentioned, behavior sort of straddles this line. It's inheritable, but can be inherited in multiple different ways. It's a trait in the sense like it's beneficial for um, overall success in an environment, but it's not like a physical characteristic, like say um, neck length if you're a giraffe, right? So keep this question going through the back of your mind. Is behavior a trait? Is it something that evolution itself would act upon? And 
there's no like correct answer to this. I don't expect you to answer it or anything like that, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Keep thinking about it um, because I think it's an interesting thing. And uh, this is one of the reasons I like this lecture a lot is because it sort of, you know, makes you think about, okay, is this how, how do, how are the behaviors that I do on a day-to-day -day basis affect or affected by evolution or my heredity and stuff like that. So uh, behavior simply just is defined as broadly as the all actions performed by an organism. And this is typically in response to an environment can do. And when we're thinking about behavior as well, they can be innate or acquired, and innate is something you're born with it, right? So salmon swimming upstream, that's something that's innate, that's what they're born with. But something acquired is like language, right? You had to acquire language as an individual, you had to acquire the capacity to speak. Um, that's, so that's an acquired behavior. You're not born with the ability to speak, you have to be taught to speak. Um, that being said, there is underlying traits under these, right? So for a salmon to be able to swim upstream, it has to have muscles and, and fins and stuff like that. And that's, that's a trait. It's a physical trait we can see. Um, but we're thinking about acquired trait, right? If you think of something like speech, you had to have the mental capacity to, uh, to understand and process and do speech, right? Um, that's, that's a trait, right? Brain size is a trait. The wiring of your brain is a trait. You also had to have the vocal cords for speech, right? Again, traits. So manifestation, but it's relying under, it's relying about underlying traits. And overall behavior can be simple or complex. So simple as in, you know, I teach my dog to go outside and go to the bathroom. That's a pretty simple behavior. A pretty complex behavior would be, you know, me telling my dog to go to the fridge, get me um, a soda, bring it back, open it and serve it to me. Right? That's a complex trait. Um, you know, language is a great example of another very complex trait. It's not something that's evolved a lot. Um, in terms of um, complexity. So, and then um, as, as we all know, behavior can be both selfish or altruistic. Uh, selfish, I'm pretty sure you guys don't know what that means. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm sure you guys know at least one person in your life that is selfish. Um, and altruistic means it's essentially like self-sacrificing. You're, you know, doing things for the good of others. And so I hope you know many more people who that are altruistic than selfish in your life. So, <clears throat> And it does have evolutionary value. Um, you know, being able to say, speak, allows humans to communicate in ways and do things at a massive level, right? So, you know, if you look at countries um, that are doing really well against COVID-19, um, you know, say like New Zealand, they have this really great network of communication and they buy all this great communication and, and all this talking and all this action and planning, they were able to essentially completely eradicate the disease from their country. And so that has, in terms of evolutionary value, that's a really big deal, right? You can imagine you have this really big problem. And if you have a behavior like communication, you can potentially eradicate this really large, really large problem. And so it has evolutionary value. Because remember, evolution is all about the environment selecting and passing, be able to pass your traits on to the next generation. And if you have the capacity to survive something really tough, like a pandemic, it makes you more likely to pass your traits on to the next generation. So I think that's an important thing to think. It does have evolutionary value. Um, and it can be overall and genetically or taught. And when we're thinking about this, right, we've been talking about evolution, it has to be inheritable, right? And the mechanism we sort of put forth for this and the mechanism by which we typically think how evolution works is by DNA, right? So when we're thinking about this, you can inherit DNA, but can you inherit a behavior? And the answer to that is yes and no. Certain behaviors you can't be inherited, right? There's traits that are essentially innate that you're essentially born with, right? The salmon swimming upstream, that's something you're born with. Or a baby that comes out of the womb, that suckling behavior that babies have, that's an innate trait, right? That's something that is genetically wired into you. But then again, on the other side, you have things that need to be taught, right? Language, walking, talking, right? Those things have to be taught. So it can be inherited in a couple different ways. And so just as sort of an example of this, <clears throat> um, humans have a, um, a feeding preference. So we like sh foods that are very high in fat and that are high in sugar. And I think as the, essentially the, one of the most obese countries in the world and how prolific 
you know, um, you know, corporations like McDonald's, Burger King, and so on and so forth are in this country. I think you all know that Americans like fatty food, we like salty food, and we also love our sweets, right? You know, there's a there's this crazy statistic that Americans every day eat, um, what is it, a hundred acres of pizza, which is as what you think about it is is absurd, right? A hundred acres of pizzas is a ton, right? But that's a fatty food. Um, it ha you know, dough has sugar in it, but you know, it's just, just an absurd amount of food when you think about it, right? And so humans inherently, we all, it doesn't matter, just not just Americans, but um, as Americans, we sort of take things to the extreme because, you know, that's just kind of how we are. Um, but across the world, we have this overall preference for high fat and high sugar. It doesn't really matter where you're from. All humans like sh sugary food. All humans like fatty food. And this is actually kind of a true thing for a lot of mammals. Uh, and, you know, you should be thinking to yourself, well, why do all mammals sort of crave high fat, high sugar? And the sort of, you know, the conclusion I would hope you come to is sugary foods means instant energy, right? And that's a good thing, right? You can toss sugar straight into your cellular respiration and you can get energy, right? You get that ATP. And you might also remember back from our energy class that fats, they have very high energy. It takes a long time to break them down, but they have very high energy. So both of these give high energy in different um, time frames. fat tissue under a microscope, it's yellow. Also, fat tissue is gross. It's just like, when you look at it, it's, it's gross. But that's not the point. Uh, and then we have the sugar content in gluten. And you'll notice is that the fat content, as it increases, our desire for and our preference for the fatty food never sort of ceases to exist, right? We are always sort of craving fatty foods. But one of the interesting things is as we add more and more sugar, we eventually get to this apex where we sort of flatten this curve and say, well, too much sugar, not good. And I think that's uh, something we could probably all relate to, right? If you have a piece of cake that's, you know, the frosting is too sugary, well, that cake's not that great, right? But maybe the underlying cake's good because it's still nice and fatty, right? Not as high in sugar, but it's still kind of fatty with the butter and the oil and stuff like that, right? And so there's this innate behavior humans have, this feeding preference that we have, and you can simply measure it, right? How much sugar is good, how much fat is good. And so this is something that all humans have. This is an innate behavior that we all have, our desire for fatty and sugary foods. Now, you guys might differ from this. Like I, I remember when I was an undergraduate, oops, I'm sorry about that. I met, um, I met a kid that did not like sugary food at all, at all. He wouldn't eat ice cream or anything like that. It was, he was just an odd kid. And his sugar content, would, his little bump would have been back here. Very, very little sugar in his food, but he loved fatty foods. And I've seen people be the opposite. I like really sugary foods personally, but I don't really like fatty foods. So there is variability on this trait, but there is an overall societal relationship between, uh, and again, it's a perfectly just natural human things do. We like sugar, we like fat, but we like more fat than sugar. And again, this is an evolutionary thing, right? Getting the most energy, you know, we don't think about that nowadays, right? At least in sort of more developed countries, but like, you know, historically speaking, you know, energy was a big deal and being able to get fatty food, um, and sugary food was good because you had all this energy from it. So that's one behavior. Feeding preferences, I think, is an interesting one for humans. But um, we're going to talk about a sort of a more natural example. And so um, we have our starlings. Um, so these are birds. You've probably all seen them before. Um, they're spread all across the United States. Actually, starlings are spread kind of all across the world. There's many, many different species of starlings. Um, one of the interesting things about starlings is they're sort of omnivorous, meaning they eat pretty much anything. So they'll eat seeds, they'll eat bugs, they'll eat, you know, some vegetation, but they prefer uh, insect larvae over other food types. And the question you can ask about that is why? Um, and the reason they do this is because insect larvae, relative to seeds, just has more energy. So the same energy it would take for them to catch a bug or catch a larva is the same energy it would take for them to catch a seed or pick up a seed, I should say. You don't really catch a, catch a seed. But um, the idea being is that I have a, he has a preference for one over the other, and the idea being is insects simply have more energy than a seed, right? Seeds have great energy, but it's not that delicious. Well, you guys are not gonna think it's delicious, but birds are gonna think that insect larvae are delicious because they got proteins and fats and all these nutrients that you know seeds just don't have. So they have this innate preference, they know this, by they know eating one is better for them than the other. 
And um, just sort of as the final one, um, we have a crab here. Uh, so these are, uh, it's a blue crab, if I'm not mistaken. And so our blue crabs here, they like to feed on mussels. Uh, in particular, uh, this, this is a blue mussel here. And they have evolved this sort of this behavior um, where they will essentially select sort of the middle of the road type size of mussel. And you can imagine if you're a crab, you got these big claws and they're, they're muscular, right? Crab, you know, for those of you that eat, have eaten crab before, you know the claws have tons of good tissue for you to eat, which that's all just muscle, right? And so they have these big muscles in their, in their claws and they're designed for cracking open shells. Now you can imagine there's a trade-off between how big a muscle is going to be and how, you know, you can imagine there's this sort of relationship between how much, how big a muscle is and how much energy it takes to break it open, right? So think about if you're, you know, you're trying to carry a piano up the stairs, right? A piano that's, you know, two feet wide is way easier to carry up the stairs than a piano that is five feet wide, right? And that's the same thing with muscles. The bigger the muscle, the harder it is to break open. But you can imagine that the bigger the muscle, well, the more energy that muscle is going to have. And so these crabs have evolved this, essentially this feeding behavior to maximize energy efficiency. So they will go for essentially the, the, the muscles that are sort of in the middle, that are tough to break open. They require some energy investment, but they're still going to get more energy back than from the muscle by eating it than they would um, by opening. And the idea being is they won't go for things that are too small because while it takes, while even small muscles are hard to break open and there's just not enough energy in there. And they won't go for the very large things because it require too much energy to essentially open the big muscles, even though there's much more energy in the big muscles. So there's this trade-off that these crabs have, and there's a trade-off that most animals make between how hard it is to catch what you eat or how hard it is to open what you eat in the, form, in the um, example of the crabs here, and how much energy you're going to get out the back end. Because we don't, you know, we as humans, you know, we don't really, you know, think about, you know, you energy to get food, right? We go to work and we buy food at the store, right? We don't go out and hunt, right? We don't go out and chase a deer down, <clears throat> you know, you know, kill the deer, you know, process the deer and stuff like that, right? We don't, we don't do that, right? There's, we, we've sort of evolved past that. But if you're a natural animal, you have to think about this trade-off. How much energy am I going to put into catching something versus how much I'm going to get out? And so there is this, that trade-off between, again, it's an evolved behavioral trade-off here, right? How much energy I put in versus how much I get out. And so we're going to sort of talk, switch gears a little bit, um, thinking about more of this dynamic between innate versus learned. And I mentioned innate is something you're born with, learned is something you have to physically te be taught or learn on the fly. And so innate, again, you're born with it. It's something that's encoded in your genes. Now, it's encoded in your genes in one of two capacities. Now, it's encoded as a physical gene, right? There's a DNA sequence for it that says, I can do this, right? And that, that might be like, okay, I have this gene that lets me make, or a bunch of genes that lets me make muscle tissue, which about that, um, if you, you should go back and look at our um, evol evolution class number one, just as a refresher, if you don't remember fully what um, epigenetics is. But the idea being is if you have an ancestor that learns a behavior uh, and they can mark their DNA, uh, essentially put an epigenetic mark on it, which can be inheritable, which will modify your behavior. And the example we gave about when we talked about epigenetics was the Dutch famine. So there was a behavioral change in making smaller babies, and this was inheritable. Right. And so that's a behavior that's innate. It's not technically encoded in a gene, but it's still encoded in your DNA. So that's that's the avenue we're working with here. So one of two ways you have a gene for it or you make a modification to your DNA for it. Um, and I will I will make note is most of a, most epigenetic sort of behavior and stuff like that that we know of is mostly in just in animals. We don't really know about it in microbes. It doesn't really seem to be a thing there. There's not really major behaviors that microbes will sort of pass down. They, they don't operate the same way we do, just as a, just as a note. Um, and so the, you know, the example I gave you earlier is an innate behavior of suckling in babies. When you're born, you know innately to suckle. And this is true for all mammals, all uh, mammals that feed on breast milk. 
or milk of some sort. Um, and so you, you, when you're a baby, you know how to suckle. And so you don't ever have to teach a baby how to suckle. You might have issues like getting a baby to, you know, latch on um, during, you know, breastfeeding or something like that. But you never have to teach a baby physically how to do something. And again, that is something that is we are humans are born with. Um, in addition, we know that um, uh, we, there's many, many other innate behaviors in nature. And so, for instance, one of my favorite ones is sort of what fish do during breeding season. And so we have... Um, uh, stickleback fish, um, they're a really commonly studied group of fish. They're not particularly very exciting. But one of the interesting things they do is when, um, when they're not breeding, they take one different color. But during breeding season, they will essentially uh, completely change color, um, which would make them more attractive towards a female. And so they have this innate behavior. They can turn it on and off. They don't think about it. It just happens. They're born with it. Right? Another example I gave you was salmon swimming upstream, right? That's something they know innately to do. They don't have to be taught. It's something they're born with, something that is genetically inherited, either through DNA or through some sort of epigenetic, uh, epigenetic um, modification. And there's all sorts of other things out there. There's tons and tons of behaviors out there that you might not think about that are innate, that these things are born with once they're adults or even when they're babies, they know how to do. And they're, they could be as simple as a dolphin leaping on water or it can be something extremely complex, like a spider spinning a very intricate and large web, or a, cocoon, a caterpillar going, um, making cocoon and, and turning into a pupa, or as complex as a bird making a nest. So behaviors have a spectrum from very simple to very complex. And jumping out of a water is pretty simple, but making a web, building a nest, that's complex, right? So there's this sort of spectrum here. And, Getting a little bit more complex, so we, there is, um, there's a group of mice. Um, they're very closely related, so we have the deer mouse and we have the beach mouse. Now, in an evolutionary sense, if you brought these two species together, they actually could still mate and produce viable, you know, fertile offspring. So they're not technically a species, but, you know, they live in very different habitats. So you, as you can see, they're very, very different looking. So the beach mouse um, lives clearly, as you can see, on the beach with nice white sand and the deer mouse lives, um, well, this is a picture in a cage, but it does live in the woods. And, uh, um, and so you'll notice they have very different colorations. And you can actually look at how their behavior of making burrows is. So burrows is a much more complex sort of process, right? We have our deer mouse, again, that woodland one, it builds a burrow, it has no escape tunnel. That's in contrast to our beach mouse, which builds a much, much longer tunnel, as well as an escape tunnel. And you can ask yourself, why would that be? And I hope the answer you would come to eventually, or maybe you came to it right away is, well, if you live on a beach, you're kind of afraid of being killed by the ocean. And so you build this longer tunnel and this escape tunnel to allow you to essentially respond to any tidal water coming in. And you have this escape tunnel for allow you to escape. And so this is behavior started off as the same behavior, right? Building a short, a uh, little short burrow, but it, it was essentially adapted by this new environment to build a longer tunnel and an escape tunnel. Again, not beneficial in the woods where this deer mouse would be living, but highly beneficial inside of our, um, our beach mouse. The ocean is mean, man. It uh, nothing, uh, doesn't like to be stopped. So. And so that's innate behavior, stuff you're learned, but it can be, again, it can be something as, you know, that's, you know, between species is very similar, but has evolved as the environment changes. So again, it is technically something that can be selected for by the environment, right? This is not beneficial on the beach. This is not beneficial in the forest, but when you put them in the right environment, let the environment select for the behavior, it's, 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 it's a beneficiary in an evolutionary sense. So that's um, uh, our uh, innate behavior. Let's switch uh, gears a bit and talk about our learned or prepared behavior. And learned or prepared behavior can be something the organism sees and acts out and retains for uh, future use, or it's something that can be taught by uh, an elder or taught by um, a peer. And so the idea being is we can think of just a very, very simple Example here of our, our lovely captive monkey. It wants its food, but right now it has no fear of snakes, right? It was never really taught to be afraid of snakes, and it has no reason to be afraid of snakes. 
right? And then eventually it's exposed to some sort of fear of snakes, right? It gets bit by a snake. It gets, you know, the snake does a warning sign on it. Um, or potentially it sees one of its friends being attacked by a snake. And so it learns that snakes are bad, that snakes are to be feared, and that the next time it experiences a snake, it's going to be afraid of it. It's going to want to get away from it or potentially attack it, right? And so that's what we're thinking about, right? This is the monkey see sort of monkey do aspect right here. I see something bad, I learn about something bad, and now I learn it's bad, right? You know, it's like if you, you know, inherently like, you know, you're not afraid of a dog, but if you ever get bit by a dog, you might become afraid of dogs because you got bit by a dog. Um, and so one of the sort of interesting things about this idea of learned behavior, it's not, tip, it's not inheritable like on DNA at all, right? It's not something you can get from your parents. So if your dad's afraid of dogs, you're not going to be born afraid of dogs. Your dad has to physically teach you to be afraid of dogs, or you have to learn that dogs are bad on your own. So it's not inheritable DNA mechanism, but it is something that can be passed down from parent to child um, or, peer, or sibling to sibling, right? But, so, but it's not a DNA-related um, trait. Um, <clears throat> and again, we can also think about, you know, humans as well. You know, we have, we're, we're inherently naturally afraid of snakes. Um, you don't have to really worry about, you know, snakes because it's, you know, we, you know, as a human, as a human group, we, you know, as we, as we discussed last class, um, you know, we started on the African savanna, chock full of very dangerous snakes. It was evolutionary beneficial to be naturally afraid of snakes. So if you are afraid of snakes, don't worry. It's all your ancestors' fault, not yours. But guns are sort of a new thing, right? Um, and we're not inherently afraid of guns when we see them. But if we have, you know, like say in the United States where we have lots and lots of gun violence, well, we might learn to be afraid of guns by exposure to them, either directly or indirectly. And so that's what we're thinking about here. Something that has to be taught. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have all heard of the sort of the classic experiment of Pavlov's dog. Um, the, you know, something that the, or the, the scientist was conditioning his dog to essentially hear a bell and think he was going to get a treat. And the dog wouldn't conditionally because he was trained or he learned this behavior that associating a bell with a treat would essentially um, be a good thing for him to learn. He learned it. And so the, the researcher would ring the bell and the dog would expect a treat. And for those of you that have dogs, you know that dogs salivate like crazy when they think they're going to get fed or they're, this is the potential. Really likes to lay on her back. She likes to be swaddled like a baby. And so this is behavior that she likes a lot. And so we taught her how to do this. So what she does is she goes to the edge of the couch. She sits on the edge of the couch and looks back at my wife. And she kind of just does like a little whimper. Like a woo-woo. It's pretty cute. And we know, oops, my uh, assistant on my thing wanted to answer a question for me. <laughs> um, she does a little woo-woo. And my wife knows to fix the blanket, pull her back, wrap her in the blanket like, like a baby so that my dog can sleep. So that's a behavior my dog has learned. We've taught her that if she wants that behavior, she wants to do that, she has to do a very specific thing. So that's my little story about my dog and how weird she is and how she likes to be swallowed like a baby. So, um, And so my dog's behavior is um, sort of a slightly complex type of behavior. Um, being afraid of something, uh, swimming upstream, they're sort of very simple behaviors, but not all behavior is simple. And, um, you know, we talked about speech being a very complex behavior, but, um, we, you know, a lot of traits are sort of simple. Uh, but one of the sort of interesting things is, you know, a trait, I'm sorry, a, a behavior doesn't have to always stay simple. Very much like, say, complexity of, um, of the human brain, right? It, it can start off simple. It can get much more complex over time. And so one of the sort of interesting things you can do with geese is, naturally speaking, if you take an egg out of a geese's nest and you move it out, it will naturally come back and it will naturally go find that egg, even if it's like 100 yards away. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, and they'll bring that egg back. They'll roll it back. And sort of one of the interesting things is, 
Um, that's the very simple behavior, right? It's very easy to sort of do. It's a natural thing. It's beneficial for the geese, right? That's the behavior they have. One of the interesting things is you can put a soda can um, in a geese's nest, leave it there for a couple of days, and then take the soda can out and move it out of the nest, and the geese will go get it. So it'll think it's one of its own. So it's a behavior you're, you're making more complex by putting in something that is, not, um, that is not a goose egg, but is something that the geese can go get. And then finally, one of the other thing you can do is take a couple of the eggs out and then put something, a much larger thing that resembles an egg out of a geese and put them away from the nest. And one of the interesting things that the geese will do will actually get the largest egg-like object first and then get its eggs after. Um, and the idea being is that this behavioral pattern that the goose is doing is essentially just a script, right? It's just following a sort of a logical and very simple thing. Go get my eggs. Go get what resembles eggs. Go get things that are in my nest. And now the idea being is you have this simple rule. You can make this rule much more complex. Now, going to get a soda can or going to get an egg-like thing is not very complex, but you can imagine, like, maybe if the geese could modify this behavior, it could become a much more complex behavior. And um, <clears throat> uh, sort of as a last note about this, um, you can modify geese's behavior with this to do all sorts of cool things, like, you know, do mazes and find things and solve very simple puzzles. So you can make this idea more complex. And you, if you have a very complex behavior, again, think of something like speech. When you're a baby, you start off with, you know, Google Gaga's and stuff like that. Then you move up to single words, right? And then from there, you move up to multiple, you know, multiple words. And then eventually you move up to sentences. And then you're sort of speaking like an adult, right? You started off with very simple rules of how to move your mouth and make noises. And then you got them much more complex over time, right? Just making words, stringing those words together from sentences, and eventually turning those sentences into full conversations, right? You started with very simple rules, and you tweak those rules to become more complex. And again, speech is a very complex behavior. We don't really think about it because we do it every day. It's vital to what we do, but there's nothing on the planet that communicates like humans. So I think that's an important thing to think of. You can take easy patterns, small patterns like this, and make them more complex by building on them. And um, so and those are innate versus uh, learned behaviors, but there are other types of behaviors that organisms do. And so these, there's... Um, there's kindness, and this is not something that's unique to the human, to humans. Um, this idea of altruism is a behavior that comes at the cost of the user, but benefits the recipient. Now, and um, the, the other thing I'll mention is that altruism is typically related to what we call kin selection or reciprocal altruism. Kin selection being something you do for your offspring or your family. And reciprocal altruism is basically you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? You do something for me, I'll do something for you. And um, sort of interesting thing, um, you know, we can think one thing commonly spiders will do is the mother spiders will lay a clutch of eggs and they'll allow essentially the, their offspring to eat them. And um, it's actually sort of an interesting thing. You would think that a mother spider letting her offspring devour her, which sounds really sort of awful, but you would think that would be a, an altruistic behavior, right? She's letting her young get benefits. Um, but actually sort of the interesting thing you could actually think about is, well, by letting your kids eat you alive, again, sounds awful. Especially the way spiders kill you, they, you know, they liquefy you. It sounds awful. But uh, you can imagine that this might be beneficial to the kids, but actually it's more beneficial to the mother. Because remember, when we're thinking about life, it's all about passing your genes on to the next generation, making sure your offspring are more fit to survive. And by allowing your children to eat you, well, you're being a little bit selfish because you're making sure your genes get passed on. So kind of an interesting thing to think about. So let's talk about kin selection. Again, this is helping your family or those closely related to you. And it typically comes at some sort of cost to yourself, but with no cost to your family. Now, so sort of the, the classic example, um, and the way this was sort of really, this, this idea was put forth was looking at groundhogs um, or ground squirrels. And for those of you that know about groundhogs or ground squirrels, they live in colonies, um, closely related people, and they live in little burrows. And if, for those of you that have ever seen um, the, what is it, Planet Earth, they have a really great little segment on these guys on Planet Earth, but you'll know that they live in a colony, they live in a sort of, oops, they live in a sort of a defined area. And they have one organism, I'm sorry, one um, essentially uh, member of their clan 
that essentially sits at the high ground and keeps a watch out. And they, and the idea. out to the wild right you're saying hey i'm here um i'm basically here come get me and so this this essentially this this ground squirrel or this groundhog is self-sacrificing right he's making himself more visible to predators but he's trying to help his family so he's sacrificing his family's not sacrificing anything but he's sacrificing potentially being eaten by this predator um so that his family can be saved Right, so that's kin selection, helping others, and that's a pretty common thing humans do as well. You know, um, I moved back in June, and so I I called up um, my my best buddy that I consider to be my family, and I was like, hey, I need you to help me move, and he was like, yep, I'll come help you, and so he helped me move. It was a pain in the butt. He got nothing out of it, but I got someone to help me move, and so kin selection is something we do pretty commonly, right? You're more likely to help your family out than you are to help, say, a stranger. Because while it doesn't, may not directly benefit you, it certainly benefits your family. And, and you're, we're all from the, the same pool, so same gene pool. Um, and the idea being is it's, it is an evolutionary benefit, right? Helping those that are closely related to you have similar traits as you, right? Have similar genetics as you, which means they're more likely to pass their genes on to the next generation. And that is that does have an evolutionary benefit for your clan, right? You can think of, you know, the population being sort of one super organism. Well, helping out that super organism is, is a beneficial thing overall. And, you know, and just a sort of a, another way we can think about this in terms of humans is, is how we divide wealth. And so if you think about how someone does inheritance, um, if you look at the distribution of, say, a person's assets, pretending they, you know, they actually die and leave assets behind. Well, you can look at how they're, they're essentially, they distribute those assets. Um, and you'll notice that in the red here, the genetic kin or spouses get most of this person's asset. And then our blues here are essentially non-relatives, right? And you'll see that the vast majority of this person's wealth goes to people that are related to them, right? Helping out your kin, helping out your population of people. And you'll notice that a very small amount sort of goes to um, non-relatives. And the idea being is that giving this to closely related people um, helps you essentially indirectly, right? It's at a cost to you, but it's helping people that are closely related to you that are part of your gene pool, potentially helping pass on things to the next generation. So that's kin selection, getting, giving something close to people and not really getting anything back. Um, next up is reciprocal altruism, doing something for someone, but expecting something in return. So this is, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. So the example I gave of early of my buddy helping me move, well, when he moves next time, I'm going to have to go help him, right? He helped me move, and thus he expects me to help him move. Though I'm much nicer about the moving because I actually pack up my stuff before he gets there, as opposed to him who forces me to help him pack. But the idea being is you can give, it, it's something that gives a, sort of has a cost to you, but it's something that's returned later. And so one of the things that we've seen and one of the sort of the really interesting cases that we see in nature is uh, altruism in, in vampire bats. And so for those of you that have ever heard of a vampire bat, they, they, they're only bats that feed on blood. Um, so, and then, you know, it's not like Dracula, you know, like draining a thing of blood. It's just very small amounts of blood. Um, really important. Bats are really important, just as a note. We're, we'll talk about bats later in the semester. Um, but reciprocal altruism in bats works is if you have a bat um, and you live in a colony, well, your neighbor might be sick and he might not be able to go fly out and feed on blood. Well, reciprocal altruism in bats is if you have a bat that can go out and feed, it will bring back extra blood or even the same amount of blood, essentially feed the bat that physically can't fly. So essentially like feeding this bat so he could survive whatever's making him sick. And then in return later, the bat that was sick will bring blood meals for the friend that helped him in need. I know that kind of sounds gross um, with the blood and stuff like that, but that's, that's what we're thinking about here, right? Reciprocal. One bat gets benefit right away. Another bat waits down the line to get that benefits. 
Um, we also see this with grooming. And so the, the primate world has evolved pretty complex grooming behaviors. Um, I'm sure you guys have all seen this at some point in your life, but the idea being is there is some uh, primates will groom one another. Um, humans technically do the same thing, but it's not in the sense of picking out bugs and eat them. But the idea being is we'll groom one another and there'll be sort of a back and forth here, right? This monkey will be groomed and then he will groom this monkey, right? So there is some sort of back and forth here. And this sort of all classic, I scratch my back, you scratch yours. So, um, but the question we can then ask is, we've sort of been talking about behaviors that are potentially beneficial, but is, is all behaviors beneficial? Does something, does everything we do benefit the environment? Does it always benefit yourself? Does it always benefit the people around you, the organisms around you? So we can ask the question, what happens when you're put into an alien environment? And when I say alien environment, I just mean a new environment. And um, so let's talk about an idea here. So we can do, um, we can take our ground squirrel analogy here. And we can take a non-related, a non-related non um, ground squirrel here and pop them into a brand new environment. Now we can pretend this this ground squirrel, and they've done this experiment before. But we can pretend this ground squirrel in its natural environment with its normal family was the caller, right? He was the he was the watch for the predators. Now we can imagine if this is not this ground squirrel's family, there is actually no benefit for this ground squirrel to draw attention, right? There's no reason that this ground squirrel that's not related to all these other ground squirrels should sacrifice itself or potentially sacrifice itself to help those around it. And so you can set up this situation where you put something in a new environment, you use its normal behavior, but it's not actually beneficial. Because remember, in its natural state, this is beneficial because it's helping its family. And so not all behavior is beneficial in all situations. And so overall, um, you know, behavior is not always beneficial. Sometimes behavior can lead to your death, as we saw with the spiders. And in unnatural situations like this ground squirrel, this is not a particularly beneficial thing because this behavior, again, was all done because of your kin, right? Helping those who are closely related. If you have a group that's not closely related, this behavior is not beneficial. Um, and sort of one of other sort of aspects of behavior is genetics. And so there's this concept of group selection, that traits that are beneficial to the greater good, but essentially at a cost to the user. And so this comes to this idea for the good of the group or good of many or the good of population. And um, the idea being is if you, if you do something for your environment and it's really beneficial, but it's at a heavy cost to you, question could be is why does evolution keep this you know a thing right one of the sort of interesting things about evolution is it would typically benefit the selfish right you you're trying to pass on your own genes to the next generation chip get out of here buddy erica can you come get chip sorry guys my dog just um jumped chip get lost buddy Sorry, give me one sec, guys. Sorry about that, guys. I just, um, I, <laughs> we adopted a new puppy and he doesn't understand that he can't go certain places. So, sorry about that. Uh, back to group selection. So group selection, again, um, is the idea being that traits that are beneficial for the greater good, but they come at a cost to you. And now the interesting thing about natural selection and evolution is that evolution typically favors the selfish, right? The idea being is that you have traits and traits and behaviors that allow you to, you as an individual, more likely to pass on those traits to the next generation. But sort of this interesting thing with group selection is sometimes evolution favors traits that benefit the group as opposed to the individual. Now, sort of a weird sort of trade-off, right? You would imagine, again, with evolutionary straight thinking, what is best for you, traits that are best for you to pass on your genes would be the best. But there is this group selection idea where evolution will select traits or even genetics that are more beneficial for the population. So you can imagine is a... Uh, what we, so typically what we normally see is if you have a gene or an allele um, here, blue is essentially the selfish version and green is the, hey, what's beneficial for, um, 
everyone, what evolution should do is essentially take this allele that hurts you but benefits the group, um, essentially drive that out of the population because it reduces your own potential for reproductive success. And so the population should be de de essentially dominated by alleles that um, are essentially selfish, which makes you more likely to pass on your behavior to the next generation. But there's a sort of interesting thing. When we look at um, lions, there are traits within the population of lions that are essentially detrimental to the overall population, I'm sorry, the, to the individual, but greatly benefit the population. Now, the idea being here is there's a behavior, a genetic behavior in lions where they hunt in groups and they, what they will do essentially is they will hunt down an individual, like say a warthog here. They will kill that warthog. And what they will do is essentially a, with their behavior is that they will allow say the dominant male or the dominant female to essentially feed first. And so it's this idea that there's, it's good for the group because the dominant ones, the ones that have the best genetics are getting the food and then everything else sort of trickles down, right? And so the idea being is that you can have a trait that is not really self-serving, but persists in the population as a whole as a behavior. And so that's sort of this weird thing. And this is something that humans do as well. We, we have a lot of group selection. There's lots of things humans do behaviorally that is not particularly beneficial for us, but benefits as a group, right? You can just look at how we work as humans, right? We, um, you know, we go to work, we work really hard, right? And we pay taxes, right? And those taxes go to serve the greater good, well, potentially go to serve the greater good, um, may not be the greater good if you're giving it to very large corporations, but it certainly is serving the greater good if it's for, say, a social program like, you know, food stamps or things like that. So we, we certainly do this a lot, um, uh, and, it, and it is something that is re relatively common in nature as well. So, um, so next up on our sort of line of behavior is actually what happens during sexy time, and um, as you'll sort of find out, there's a lot of behavior that is associated with mating, because mating is kind of a big deal, right? We talked about behavior during mating times to be a, a, a way to reproductively isolate and create a new species, but how organisms decide who they're going to mate with and essentially create offspring with is kind of a big deal. So there's a lot of behavior associated with conceiving as well as rearing offspring. And these behaviors can be very, very simple and they can be very, very complex. And so you, you all probably know this, you're adults. And so we're going to start with the behavior associated with after making children. And so there's numbers of behaviors that are associated um, once you physically conceive an offspring. So none of this sort of pre-offspring conceivement. And so there's three types of reproductive investment we can talk about. And so the first one we'll, we'll just talk about is actually the, the most simple. And this is essentially no investment. And so the vast majority of um, reptiles, vast majority of... Um, you know, in, invertebrates um, and lots of uh, amphibians and stuff like that uh, take this no investment approach where they essentially lay eggs or they give birth and they essentially um, uh, invest no time in their offspring. Their offspring are essentially on their own. So that's the most simple case where they essentially invest no time. Um, slightly more complex is where you have a very heavy maternal investment. And this is pretty common in the mammalian world. Um, you know, we could see a um, uh, I want to say this in Isaac, but that's that's probably not true. This mammal that's very much like a goat that is um, escaping my brain right now. Um, you have you can see the mother is essentially raising the kid, and again, this is pretty common um, in the animal kingdom. Um, and then we have sort of uh, a much more advanced behavior where we have both ma male and females taking advantage, taking care of the child. We're seeing this with the penguins. This is how the average, you know, average everyday uh, American family is, or not just American family, but human family, right? Two parents taking care of the child. Um, and so just, it's all related to investment. No investment, investment of one partner, investment of both partners. And it depends on where you are, what type of organism you are. Um, there's all sorts of differing behaviors. Um, there's also um, sort of one other type uh, of behavior. 
I, I don't have a, a sort of a slide for it, but it's like when you take care of um, things as a group. And so, you know, we commonly see this in lions or seals where you have, you know, one dominant male and a bunch of females and all the females collectively take, take care of all the children. Um, while the male just sort of does his own thing. So there is a, there's a sort of a fourth avenue as well. So that's after children are born, and that's a behavior, and it's pretty uh, consistent depending on what group you're in. So most birds behave like this. Almost all amphibians and invertebrates and frogs and stuff like that behave like this. And the vast majority of mammals behave like this. But the question we can ask is, um, who does the choosing? So what happens before mating occurs? And so, you know, we can think of humans. Um, you would sort of make this analogous to courtship, right? Who does the choosing? And that's all based on how you court your... Aries a clutch of eggs or it carries the offspring to term, right? And so there's a pretty heavy investment on the side of the female. So in most cases, the female typically tends to be the choosiest because she's investing the most energy to create the offspring. Um, and remember to create eggs, there's a much greater investment than there is to create sperm. So most animals, it's the female that does the choosing. Um, but there are other types of animals out there where the male does the choosing. So the example I'll give you here is actually a bush cricket. And this is what bush crickets look like. Um, they're pretty ugly crickets. Um, and sort of interesting things, males um, will produce uh, an ejaculate of sperm. Um, I'm sorry, it's, it's gross to think about, but it's a really good example. But they produce ejaculate of sperm that is essentially a quarter of its body mass. And the idea being is it fertilizes the eggs of the female, but it also provides essentially a nutritional energy source for the female. So the male is investing 25% of its body mass to not only fertilize the egg, but, but feed the female to raise the children inside of her, right? To produce the, essentially the eggs, right? And so that's a huge investment. That'd be the, the, the you know, you know, I weigh about you know, 200 or so pounds, that'd be like me giving my wife 50 pounds of my body mass to make a child, right? That's a huge investment. And so in this case of the, of the crickets and for some other organisms, it's the male that is choosing um, because he it gives up so much of his mass. But as I mentioned, the vast majority, it's the female that is typically choosy simply because she invests the most both in the production of eggs as gametes as well as physically, you know, either rearing the child inside of her or producing the fertilized eggs inside of her. Um, and um, for, for our men, um, it's sort of an interesting thing. Sperm is cheap, and this is true for males, you know, humans. Sperm is cheap for flies. Sperm is cheap for pretty much the vast majority of males that don't act like this bush cricket that we talked about. And it's sort of interesting. Um, we can just sort of look at um, uh, sort of the energetics uh, around this and we can see we can use fruit flies as an example here and the idea being is we can look at uh, females and male fruit flies and then can see how many offspring they produce here on the y-axis and how many times they mate on the x-axis now you're seeing that no matter how many mates a female fly has she's really not producing more offspring right so there's no really relationship between how many times you mate and reproductive success that's in contrast to males and where they, the more times they mate, the more offspring they produce. And so males, they invest less, but they do it because they can mate more often. Females, they invest way more, but they can only, they, they are essentially in charge of how much offspring they produce. They're essentially in charge of what gets fertilized and how it develops. So there is a relationship between how cheap it is to produce your, your materials as well as how much reproductive success you can have. And so males will always, naturally speaking, and I guess this is also true for humans as well, is we'll typically seek out multiple options as males to increase our reproductive success, where a female doesn't particularly need to do that as a whole. Um, <clears throat> sort of as a couple other things, um, there is some really interesting behavior associated with um, courtship. Um, especially with, with our male individuals. So um, one common thing you'll see in amphibians is, um, and uh, you'll see this 
amphibians and uh, you know salamanders, frogs, things like that. Is you'll have mate guarding, and the idea being uh, fro male frogs will essentially stay uh, attached to their females for an extended period of time, mating with them to essentially um, prevent any other males from getting in on what they've already claimed. So they'll essentially do this for a month or so. Um, well, it could be longer, but typically about a month or so to prevent any other males from taking what they've claimed. So this is a pretty much more higher investment for a male than typically what we see. Um, in addition, you also uh, see uh, mate guarding insects, and this is uh, in spiders. It's a pretty common thing um, to prevent. Um, what black widow males will do is after they, you know, it's a very dangerous thing. You can see that the, the males are much smaller than the females. Um, and this is true for most spiders. But what you'll see is that the males, after they do this sort of this dangerous mating dance with the female, is they'll actually break off their penis inside the female, actually preventing another male from coming in. Um, and by breaking off his, his male parts inside her, he actually makes himself likely to get eaten by the female. So he prevents any other males from mating by, again, detaching his, his genitalia. And then he sacrifices himself to the female. So he prevents any mating attempts and also nourishes the female with his own body. Um, if you didn't think spiders were terrible now, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty, uh, pretty terrible thing <laughs> if you sort of think about it in, a, in the context of, of copulation of an individual. So... Um, so those are some behaviors. So, but the sort of the one of the biggest ways uh, we see behaviors, and in particular complex behaviors, is actually physically choosing a mate. And um, as we've talked about, natural selection chooses those with the best traits, the most fit for the current environment to mate. Right. The idea being is if you are more fit, you're more likely to have more energy. And if you have those, you're more likely to mate and you're more likely to have your genes pass on to the next generation. And so that's typically how things work, right? If I'm a much, much more fit individual, I'm more likely to mate and pass my genes on. But we can ask the question is, what if there's equal fitness in a population? How does natural selection decide who mates? And this is where mating behavior comes in. We leave traits behind, we think about behaviors now. And there's all sorts of ways and all sorts of behaviors that have evolved that have essentially um, these behavioral traits that have allowed um, uh, essentially selection to work. That an individual can evaluate two things that are essentially the same fitness and then decide which one is going to be better. And these come in four different forms. And so the, I think the, the, the easier one to understand is gifts up front. And so we have this example of a, what's called a hanging fly. Um, a female will not mate with a hanging fly unless that male brings her a nice offering of food. So that's pretty straightforward, easy to understand. Um, next up is good looks. And, uh, you know, I, the, this one's uh, also pretty straight. Think about the peacock. The peacock has, the male peacock has to have great looks. If he doesn't have great looks on its tail, he's not getting to mate with his female. Uh, another really easy one to understand is valuable resources. And, um, you know, this female squirrel is essentially would be attracted to a male squirrel that essentially controls a very large area. And then finally, the courtship rituals, which are the, the most complex form of all this behavior is doing dances, doing fighting, doing things to show that you're better um, than someone that's equally um, essentially as fit as you are. And there's a really awesome YouTube video here uh, you should take a peek at about this courtship ritual. It's really fun. Um, it's from, it's narrated by David Attenborough and as with all things that are narrated by David Attenborough, they're really awesome. So take a peek at this video on your own time. It's a really, really, uh, really, really fun video. But, um, these factors in mate selection, again, these are natural speaking and you also know these are factors in, in mate selection for humans as well, right? You know, you think of controlling value resources, like having a house or having a good job, right? And so there's all these variables that actually affect humans as well. Um, and one of the more common behaviors we actually see because of these sort of behaviors um, back here is um, what we see is polygamy, where we have, we'll typically have one dominant male in a group, and they'll mate with all the females, and they'll be the only ones producing offspring, and any other males will essentially won't really be mating, and they won't be producing offspring. And so we see this pretty commonly among marine mammals, um, especially seals, sea lions, things like that. 
where there's one dominant male, he's polygamous, he mates with all the females, because he controls, you know, he has all these behaviors. He controls resources. He is, that might not look very sexy, but that's sexy for an oh, elephant seal. He does all the good courtship rituals, and he has um, materials to bring. So he does all these behaviors, making him the dominant male. Um, the other thing that these will do is they'll fight one another. So you can see this, this male here with his grotesque nose. Uh, you see he's all battered and scarred, and he defends his females against all these other males. Um, just as a note, there's uh, also this really cool behavior in seals that we know um, where there's cheaters. And so cheating is a kind of a big deal where you'll have sneaky males come in, mate with one of the dominant males, females, and produce an offspring. So, you know, it's not a completely shut down here as well. Um, so that's polygamy. Uh, monogamy is pretty common. This is in theory, what humans do as well. Um, but most, where the idea being is that most bird species practice this against, as you can see here, it's about 90% of all bird species, so 9,000 species, practice monogamy. You have one male, one female, they stay together for life, they mate for life, they produce offspring for life. Um, this is in contrast to the polygamy. This is also in contrast to what we talked about previously, where a male will try to mate with multiple females to ensure its reproductive success. Um, and, but again, this is really common for birds. This is technically what humans do. Um, polygamy is really, really common. You know, one dominant male over many females. Um, nature's sort of a mixed bag. So there is sort of varying levels of behavior here. Um, and uh, one of the things that this has all led to is this concept of sexual dimorphism. And so this can be pretty um, stark in the case of our elephant seals. So the male elephant seals are huge. Um, and they have these big old noses. Um, we see some huge cases of sexual dimorphism here where we have huge differences between the males and the females. And this is all due to mating behaviors. The male needs to be bigger to do all those things that we talked about, right? All these different behaviors, all these different, um, you know, acts. Right? It has to be larger to physically do them. So it, this is sexual dimorphism, what we're seeing. Uh, more commonly, and this is what we see pretty much for the human race as well, we have sexual monomorphism. The idea being is there's no real differences between the sexes. They look essentially the same. There might be slight, slight differences. You, know, there's, you can see there's slight differences in traits here, um, as you would expect within a population, but there's no real sort of um, difference here. Uh, and this also goes back to the idea of how much investment typically monomorphic um, individuals typically have equal investment in their offspring, whereas sexual dimorphism, the female does all the raising as well. And the males are basically just around for mating and guarding and things like that. Humans are, again, fit into this category as well. Human males and females aren't that different um, at a population level. You know, the average height of males across the globe is like 5'6". The average height of females across the globe, I think is 5'3". So it's not a huge difference. There's not any meaningful massive meaningful difference in traits between us outside of you know sexual organs and stuff like that so we more closely fall into this line than this line so and then sort of the most complex behavior of all and we've sort of talked about this several times through the class is this concept of behavior and behaviors in, uh, i'm sorry is uh, communication and communication is an important thing it allows you to send a message to your friends it allows you to communicate chemically with with visuals with visual things or potentially acoustically with words or signs and signals right and so animals typically do uh, one of the three things so they do chemical so they so we think about the moth here it's releasing what are called pheromones which are just chemical signatures that communicate with other moths and other individuals around them we have auditory communication this is where uh, you know, we fall into with our talking, but you can think about dogs barking, uh, howling, you can think of crickets chirping, right? Anything that's auditory in nature. Um, and then finally, you can think of something visual where you have, you know, this, this male baboon here. It's got these bright colors. He's got these huge fangs. He's showing you he means business, right? So he's visually communicating to you, I'm threatening. Come near me. I'm going to bite you. This is commonly seen in like snakes and venomous things. They have bright colors that communicate, hey, I'm dangerous, don't come mess with me. So, um, and then the sort of the last communication we'll talk about, and there's a really nice video here I would recommend you take about, is uh, the most complex, which is um, essentially gonna be direct communication, uh, language, some sort of speech.
And so we can think about what we do. What we do is incredibly complex, right? There is what, if I'm remembering correctly, there's what, 2,500 different languages on this planet. I could be wrong about that. That seems high, but, and, you know, variations and dialects of different languages. So there's tons and tons of different languages. Uh, and this is something that has been around in the human population for a very, very long time. And it's gotten more complex over time, right? So we think about, you know, very complex languages like Chinese or Japanese, very, very complex, both at the spoken level and the written level. And then we could think about very simple languages like, um, like Latin or even something like uh, what Afri some African tribes do with like clickings and things like that. So it does span the gamut of being very simple or very complex. And then we have sort of a, a less complex version, which we see uh, um, this gorilla communicating with this woman, doing sign language, right? Visual communication, making things down, and now sort of, uh, sort of making signals with your hand or something in the environment. Um, another example of this type of communication would be like making cave drawings, right? Communicating to someone that comes after you, like, hey, there's buffalo around here by drawing a buffalo, right? And then finally, the sort of the most simple communication of form of complex animal communication would be what, what bees do. And what bees will do to communicate with one another is they'll dance. And so bees will dance with one another to show like, hey, here's this, here's this food source. I'm telling you about this food source that's a couple miles away. And instead of, you know, talking because bees can't talk, they dance. They vibrate their butts in a dancing way that tells bees, hey, here's this food source five miles away. Let's go. So, so with that, that's going to be the, the sort of the end of our, uh, our, talk about, um, our talk about behavior for the day. Tomorrow we're going to go into um, ecology. We're going to talk about nature. And then the following week we're going to talk about ecosystems and all sorts of cool stuff. So with that, that'll be the end of class. If you guys have any questions, as always, I will hang around. Um, but I hope you guys all have a good day and take care.